Good morning. It is an honor and privilege for me to be one of the speakers at the United Nations 14th Congress on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice in Koto, Japan, on this day, Wednesday, the 10th of March, 2021. The theme is the human dignity and faith perspective addressing inequalities and challenges to social inclusion for the imprisoned. I will use more practical experiences and information over the last 21 years with the input from our staff and volunteers of Hope Prison Ministry. I'm Reverend Jonathan Clayton, a restorative justice and victim offender dialogue international facilitator alongside my wife, the Reverend Jenny Clayton. We are the founders and executive directors of Hope Prison Ministry and also the Baptist National Prison Chaplains. We are members of the International Prison Chaplains Association. I'm also serving on the Restorative Justice International Global Council as a member. And I'm a former member of the National Council for Correctional Services, which is called the NCCS. So it is a privilege for me even to represent Hope Prison Ministry, the Department of Correctional Services, uh, one of our partners, here in South Africa, and we are proud Africans. The Reverend Jenny Clayton said, the theme is as relevant in correctional facilities as it is on the outside in our communities and our world. And it is relevant in any religion and any culture. Mr. Nelson Mandela, our icon here in South Africa and across the world, his powerful fight was for the equality of people who were judged by the color of their skin for 40 years, 27 of them in prison. Because of him, our country moved into a democratic South Africa with no civil war. The dignity of our people restored. Unfortunately, some people struggle in that area. He further said, I have fought against white domination, and I have fought against black domination. I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons will live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and achieve. But if it needs be, it is an idol for which I am prepared to die. Wow. I believe he also had offenders, prisoners, incarcerated people in mind when he said all persons. The scary reality of incarcerated people that we receive into correctional facilities is quite a challenge. Dr. David Lakin's research became a reality as we deal with our incarcerated people regarding antisocial behaviors in children. And he refers to the antisocial behavior in children to poor parenting, absent fathers, inadequate mothers, many lives destroyed and human rights violated by their own families as we meet up with these people being now incarcerated. The following behavior becomes visible in the lives of these people. And as we were dealing with those incarcerated on our restorative justice process, they confirm in terms of their antisocial behavior, the poor parenting, the absent fathers, the inadequate mothers. And the behaviors that comes out of that is fearlessness. We see them moving into gangs in the community and then into correctional centers as well. Aggressiveness. The violence is evident. Sensation seeking, there is a craving for positions within the gang. It is like they saying they want to be seen. And the result is violence and antisocial behavior leads into criminal activities. They also often lack a sense of moral responsibility and social consciousness. And that is so sad, but that is the reality. 
Our engagement with incarcerated people are beyond discrimination, like those who come into the correctional facilities and on our restorative justice process, we found that some of them were identified as psychopath, kleptomanias, pedophiles, pathological liars, habitual criminals, renowned gangsters in the community and also behind bars, identified as sexual offenders, and also those involved in uh, white collar crime in terms of fraud. And we are working with all these people. We don't discriminate against anybody. And we have stories about people's lives being changed because we respect them for who they are and don't judge them because of the crime that they committed. I've been more than 26 or 27 years in prison. I've started at the younger tender age of 15 years. I was 15 when I got sentenced. I've got exposed to a lot of things in prison. I was harassed. I was verbally abused, sexually abused, because guys wanted to just uh, sodomize me because I was a youngster, an attractive youngster. When I grew up, the same things that they wanted to do with me, I was doing it with other guys, brother. Let's touch base on human dignity and faith. I've got a statement from Dr. Ulrike Fritzen from Sweden who worked with us over the last 12 years. She said one big thing that I have thought a lot about regarding your way of conducting the restorative justice process according to human dignity and addressing the inequalities and challenges to social inclusion for those in prison is the way you trust and have faith in God's purpose with creation. That each person is created in the image of God, which is a sincere and profound faith perspective within your work. That perspective also protects the human dignity in each participant in the RJ process and helps them to become and own who they are a guilty and human being created in the image of God. This, I mean, is of great help for the participant to go into the responsibility process, the restitution, so that some more obstacles against them being included or reintegrated into the society again are being reduced. This is of huge importance. I was attending one of the restorative justice weeks and I was sitting at the table with a man who was convicted of incest on his daughter. He had denied his crime in court and continued to deny during the reconciliation program. He elaborated on a number of different reasons why everyone was wrong and claimed that he was unfairly accused and convicted. And I found it extremely hard to be his companion. What did he do here in the RJ program if he was innocent? Why had he signed up if he was innocent? I felt angry at him and I felt exhausted. What could I do? The days went by and nothing happened. And what I was tired of hearing his argument. Then came the Thursday in the program, the day of the confession. And I went to Portsmouth with absolutely no ambitions and no hope. Time passed during the day and more and more of the participants walked in front of the whole large group and put the cards on the table. They acknowledged and stood for what they had done. Everyone was affected and nervous. The seriousness of the moment and the consequences of their actions became clearer and getting closer. The man at my table just sat quietly. I had no hopes for anything. I expected nothing. Suddenly he gets up and walks up to Jonathan and says he wants to confess. And Jonathan took him by the arm and walked away to talk for a while. I think Jonathan wanted to clarify the risks to him if he confesses. But the man was firm. I want to. 
I have to. So the man walks in front of the whole group and says, I am guilty. I have used my daughter as my wife. I have exploited her and raped her. It was not true, as I said, that it was another woman. It was my daughter. I am a terrible person. And then he comes back to my table and sits down. And he looks completely exhausted, knocked out. And I am really shocked. What happened here? And then suddenly people moves in the room. Man after man in the great hall stood up and they applauded. And finally, one of the men said, now you're a man. She further said, I understand that you know the key to the process of reconciliation lay in the ability to constantly see the human being and to trust him or her. At the same time, it must be emphasized that it is difficult to work in relation to these qualities. Many processes and initiatives stop almost by themselves in relation to resistance and denial. It's easy to get frustrated, provoke and exhausted, to then be reminded to see, perhaps even search for the human being in the person who uses resistance, abandonment or denial as protection is very helpful. Your restorative justice process is protecting the human dignity and helping them to overcome challenges to social inclusion with the help of the faith in Creotia Day. We are created in the image of God, each and every one. It is very solid knowledge that you have overcome through years and years of priceless and precious experiences. Thank you very much, Dr. Ulrike Fristen, for your kind words. The amazing response from incarcerated people is when we refer to them as our clients. We experience that people want them to know that they are criminals, bandits, offenders, inmates, prisoners. But the respect and cooperation we get from the most notorious people are remarkable. We acknowledge the human dignity of every incarcerated person on our restorative justice journey. No discrimination against race, ethnic group, economic status, sexual orientation, religious beliefs or background, age, education level, including crime and gang affiliation. The restorative justice process and its facilitators do the utmost to ensure every client feels invited to participate and valued in the discussions. Listening to their life stories, the brutal and evil crime that was committed does not put us off, nor do we disrespect them. One of my staff members said that we don't force them to accept what we're saying or decide for them what programs they must do, but we give them a choice to decide for themselves. The Department of Correctional Services expect us to have an orientation with them first by explaining to them the objectives of our programs in their own language, after the orientation, they can sign up voluntary for the programs. The entire process and engagement help them to gain back their own human dignity. We never rejected them, even if they fail us or lie. We journey with them by being frank and open, but we deal with them as human beings. We don't judge or condemn them. We never have group discussions or programs without white tablecloth on the tables. Many of them said before that this shows them how we care and respect them, knowing they committed evil crimes. Our restorative justice process feeds their needs and not what we want them to do because they are more important than our programs. The outcome is that they feel seen and heard and start respecting themselves and others.
We go the extra mile to trace the families of the clients and make it possible for them to attend our Family Reconciliation Day. This also helped them to gain back their human dignity because they experienced rejection from their families because of their crime they committed. At the Family Reconciliation Day, they have the opportunity to address each other. The importance of forgiveness is stressed, and this is part of all faith. If clients want their victims to forgive them, they must also be prepared to forgive those who offended against them. Forgiveness and reconciliation require remorse, a change of behavior, and taking responsibility for their behavior. This includes breaking ties with gangsterism and evil operations. The topic of repentance requires a complete turning around, turning their backs on crime, and turning to a new life. If a client believes in God, this turning around is turning wholeheartedly to God. This has often provided a breakthrough for the client so that he or she is able to embrace the principles of restorative justice. Reconciliation starts with God but must be extended to family, the community and the victims. All religions are invited to be part of the restorative justice process in South Africa, Sweden, Seychelles, Nigeria, Kenya and Lithuania. But we respected people during the process over all these years. We never had any negative responses from the correctional services authorities, neither from religious leaders. In fact, the Muslim chaplain referred clients to us over many years. Human dignity must be priority. Clients are allowed to fail and try again. It is because the restorative justice process is based on biblical principles so that clients can experience the grace and mercy of God. It's through loving the clients like Jesus, their dignity and self-worth are often restored. One of our staff members said the following, it is in my opinion that clients who participate in the RJ are better equipped to deal with life in correctional facilities. If clients submit to the RJ process, they will grow in their ability to make healthy choices, solving problems, be self-aware, communicate effectively, and respect and honor the authorities, their fellow clients, their victims, and themselves. Inclusion in the process is of uttermost importance. For those of Christian conviction, the process offers a deepening of personal growth in a Christian spiritual life, but for everybody there is an opportunity to strive for the healing of the wounds regarding personal, family, community, and specifically victims' relationships. The principles and theories of restorative justice is beyond the borders of any religion, denomination, and faith. We learned over the years the exciting journey with all included on the journey of healing, restoration, and reconciliation. And I forgive myself for what I did. <laughs> and I want you to forgive me for what I did. <laughs> and I will never, ever do this again to you. <laughs> and I forgive myself. And I thank the Lord for giving me the power to say this to you. I am excited to announce our formerly incarcerated people. I looked again at this 
beautiful picture. And none of these people on this picture over the last five years and more reoffended again. This is our formerly incarcerated people that was part of our restorative justice process during their incarceration. We are saying today to God be the glory for these men and women who took part in this restorative justice process voluntarily and we experience how their dignity was restored. In conclusion, human dignity must be addressed, respected and implemented. The faith perspective must be introduced and shared. But we must still respect people. We must always be aware of the inequalities and address the challenges through our programs like restorative justice. Social inclusion is imperative. Our best experiences when we go into our extremely challenging communities and engage with victims of crime, the community and the families of the clients. Guilt, shame, regret affected our clients' personality and character, especially with stigmatization. Therefore, our journey with them is to understand and believe that they are redeemable and created in the image of God. No discrimination. We will always promote human dignity. I thank you, Jonathan Clayton. Thank you for the opportunity to share. It is much appreciated. God bless you all.